I'm Anthony Scacco with Riverside Investment and Development. Jim Getch, Getch Partners. Uh, on behalf of the development team, I'd like to congratulate the other nominees uh, for the Best Tall Building Americas Award uh, uh, for 2018, uh, and also give a thanks to some of the fundamental uh, and, and important team members for the project, including uh, Magnuson Clemensic Associates, Cosentini, uh, Wolf Landscape, One Lux Studio, and Clark Construction, our general contractor. Uh, 150 North Riverside, it, uh, all the way on the right-hand side of this slide, um, really represents a 20-plus year collaboration with Getch Partners um, amongst members of our development team. Um, and when it comes to uh, Class A Plus Corn Shell Office in Chicago, there are a number of kind of fundamental attributes that we seek to deliver, and, and frankly, in this market, which define a, a true trophy office tower. Uh, you know, obviously location, 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 uh, floor plate efficiency really which enters to the benefit of our users, best in class infrastructure and technology, uh, uh, tenant amenities. The quality of the architecture really is how Jim takes all of these kind of inward looking attributes and then, try, and then delivers a sense of place and, and a fit with the surrounding context uh, for the project as a whole. And then maximize value seems kind of intuitive, but what I mean by that really is, is not, uh, it's the relationship between quality and cost, not building uh, and, and gilding, gilding the lily for, for just for the sake of doing it, but really trying to take a thoughtful approach to the market, what the market needs, uh, and designing to that, that need. This is the site as it existed in 2011 when we acquired it, and the interesting thing is this is the site as it existed for close to 100 years. Uh, the site is located uh, on the confluence of the three branches of the Chicago River in the West Loop submarket, which is the premier office destination in, in Chicago. Uh, it has setbacks and adjacencies from other properties that are unlike anything else that we've worked on, but the, 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 pr the, the, the property sat basically uh, uh, undeveloped for close to 100 years. Uh, this is just a map of where the site is uh, in plan. It's a transit-oriented design. Um, immediately proximate to the two major commuter rail stations that go to the suburban communities of Chicago, that being Ogilvy Transportation Center and Union Station. It's also centrally located amongst the intracity trains known as the L here in Chicago, uh, which is represented by the solid colored lines um, on the map. So uh, if it's such a great site, you know, why did it sit undeveloped, particularly in relation to the setbacks and adjacencies that it enjoys? It's a two acre site in the middle of the CBD, so uh, logic would suggest that it would have been developed a long time ago. Uh, there's really two main factors that prohibited development uh, uh, until we were able to complete this project. The first is really assemblage related. Uh, the parcel, it's two acres, 85,700 square feet, uh, divided into three ownership groups. Uh, first is the, the parcel that we bought, uh, Fee Simple, and then the, the western two parcels, the two on the, the left-hand side there in, in light blue and then darker blue, uh, were owned by the City of Chicago and Amtrak, respectively. We had to merge uh, the parcels, including the development rights, the air rights, over the Amtrak uh, parcels in order to be able to effectuate the, the design and development of, of our building. The, the second main factor was the physical site constraints, and there's really three main constraints that, that I'll speak to. The first is the Chicago River to the east, and the City of Chicago has prescribed setback requirements for structural adjacencies uh, near the river. The second is the Amtrak railroad lines, uh, seven of which run continuously between uh, Chicago Union Station to the north. And then the third is the, the three boundaries of the site that weren't the river were actually elevated bridge structures. So we had no utilities or any other infrastructure delivered in the parcel when we bought it. I think this is a, uh, uh, gives you a good idea of the conditions of the site. To the left, the active uh, railroad uh, lines, which really precluded uh, landing any major structural uh, elements on that side. And on the right side is the Chicago River Walk, where the city requires a 30-foot wide continuous pedestrian space open to the sky. So that get left us with a very small sliver of where we could actually put the core. Here you see it in plan. One of the most important things, at least in Chicago, for an office building is to have a 45-foot lease span. So the core, uh, the three elevators and the shear wall ended up being exactly 35-foot wide with a 45-foot lease span uh, and only just touching the edge of the river because the Corps of Engineers wouldn't let us uh, 
project anything over the river. So that's the condition above grade and be below grade. If you go back one second. I can't go back. Sorry. OK, below grade. Uh, we pushed the core as far to the west as we could. So the edge, west edge of the core is only 16 feet away from the center line of the track, which is as close as uh, Amtrak would allow us to get a major uh, structure. Uh, and uh, so the, out, the, the uh, perimeter of the structure and the upper floor is it's steel. It's uh, transferred into uh, the core. And this is the part where Manglis and Clemensig really start to uh, earn their money. As you can see, the building ends up being a complete core-supported building with an aspect ratio of a 20 to 1. The gravity loads are certainly easier to manage than the wind loads, but the wind loads were handled with the use of a tuned ma liquid tuned mass damper, two 80,000 gallon uh, tanks at the top of the building. The water kind of, as the building tends to move in one direction, the water moves in the other, which controls both the acceleration and the displacement. I think this is kind of an interesting photo in the sense it gives you an idea of the magnitude of the forces as the, on the vertical, as they hit that tension floor, the floor is all in tension. The gentleman on the right is standing next to one of those members who happens to be upside down, but you can see how deep they are. Then as the diagonals go into the compression element and the verticals uh, go uh, tie into the caissons down below on the photo on the right at the bottom, is uh, the uh, two of the largest rolled sections. Each one weighs uh, 1,000 pounds a foot. So those columns are 2,000 pounds a foot. So in addition to some of the design innovations relative to the superstructure, there were several construction-related innovations that the contracting team brought to bear. Uh, the first of which was the use of ArcelorMittal A913 grade 65 steel. Uh, this particular uh, component had never been used in the Western Hemisphere uh, in this manner. And it was practically the only way that we could get to uh, rolled shapes that could actually be picked up by any of the cr types of crane equipment that we would be utilizing. The second innovation that they employed was to fully prefabricate and assemble all of the structural trusses on the shop floor of the fabricator's facility. This was done out of concerns of fit up in the field. You can imagine with structure this sensitive, the, the implications of bolt holes not aligning and things like that would be too much to overcome. So they did a full pre-assembly in the field. Uh, I mentioned that the site's surrounded by bridges on three sides and the water on the fourth side. This effectively eliminated any area for a ground-mounted crane to do the early uh, construction logistics. So uh, the contractor looked to the Chicago River, which was uh, kind of the lifeblood of the city for uh, decades, uh, and did a Manitowoc 888 ringer crane mounted on a custom designed barge floating in the middle of the water. We did picks of an in excess of 250,000 pounds with this piece of equipment uh, at night, 4 a.m. in the dark, blind over the core, um, to be able to erect the building during the time frames that Amtrak would actually allow us to work. This is a, a great view of the building superstructure in process. And you can get a, a great sense of the diagrammatic in terms of force transfer that, that Jim was uh, uh, pointing out earlier. And, and you can see how, how uh, these members actually fit up in the field. It's sort of an example of the architecture being seamlessly married to the uh, structural concept. The core of the building, granite clad, the, uh, the glass uh, structure up above seemingly kind of balanced on that core. One of the things that, uh, as you can see, this is a very large building on the river. And one of the things that we wanted to do to give the building a sense of detail and scale, so we added some uh, setbacks at the top and some re-entrant corners, changed the curtain wall, uh, details of the curtain wall in a couple of areas. In particular, on the west and the east side, we have these uh, mullions that are sort of Undulating, uh, undulating emollients kind of work against each other to create kind of an interesting pattern. At the same time, you can see the uh, structure being expressed with the stainless steel. Uh, one of the most interesting things about Chicago is the way the, uh, the river has become really the front door. The Chicago Architectural uh, 
river cruises are, is probably the mo most uh, frequented uh, tourist destination in the city. So in a way, that, that whole cruise is a cruise uh, to, to uh, celebrate Chicago architecture. And it, um, so it's a, it's a whole different view of the city. And if you haven't had a chance to do it, I recommend it does give you a completely different view of the city as you go, go around. Based on that, um, one of the, the fundamental aspects of the, the, the transaction that we paid a, a lot of attention to is the site design. Uh, as Jim just mentioned, uh, you know, this is one of the most highly trafficked areas of the city. Um, and we had the good fortune, just as a function of the basic design of the building, that our two acre site was touched by less than 25% uh, uh, of the actual tower. Um, so that left us with 75% of the site as, as basically blank canvas. And we made a decision very early on in conjunction with Jim and Wolf Landscape Architecture to dedicate this as uh, public outdoor open space in perpetuity to the city of Chicago. It is one of the largest, if not the largest, privately owned uh, public open spaces uh, in the city. Uh, there, our neighbor, there's a neighboring project to the north that has a similar circumstance. But, uh, you know, with, part, with the landscape design, we wanted to, it's a main circulatory route for the pedestrians that are going to and from the train stations. So we really wanted to try to create um, uh, an animated uh, set of scenes, different areas, uh, some active, some passive, uh, flanked by high quality food and beverage retail so as to be able to encourage residents, office workers, et cetera, to kind of mingle and utilize the site uh, uh, to the extent uh, practicable based on uh, our lovely Chicago weather. So on the left-hand side, you can see the, the river walk. And, and the city of Chicago has really started emphasizing or re-emphasizing the river, as Jim mentioned. And the river walk, both from a circulatory standpoint and from kind of a, an entertainment and leisure standpoint, has, has really uh, become profoundly different than it was even five to 10 years ago. Um, on the right-hand side, you can see we created uh, a, a multitude of o river overlooks. Uh, this is an amphitheater at the uh, right adjacent to the front door of the building. Uh, we play live music and things like that, uh, really to, again, try to engage with the, the, the public realm and create a sense of place that's somewhat unique to a, a purely office tower. Uh, this is the elevated park to the west of the building from the views of the residential balconies uh, immediately to the west. Um, if you can imagine, before this, this building was built, these residential balconies, there's some 150 of them on the, the eastern elevation of, of, that, of, that, of that building, were looking down at basically railroad tracks and breathing diesel fumes. Uh, you know, we replaced that with a three-quarter acre elevated park on the western half of the, of the site. Um, and this is down at kind of pedestrian or human <coughs> scale. You know, we planted significant quantity of mature trees, uh, over 2,000 lineal feet of seating, really, again, trying to create a space that could be utilized by the entire neighborhood as well as the, the inhabitants of our office building. This is uh, on the left is a uh, image of the building just as you enter with the doors, uh, revolving doors, and on the right is uh, you get a feeling for the space as you enter the building. Uh, one of the things, one of the challenges that we had in the elevator vestibules, uh, we have a clear view out over the river. On the, other, on the other hand, in the lobby, we have a 15 foot high blank wall, which is what covers the parking with a very uh, transparent wall, glass wall above. So we tried to blend these two things together, the dark uh, parking wall and the uh, glass uh, uh, the glass wall above. That wall is, uh, is supported with uh, glass mullions, 90 feet tall, suspended from above and pinned at the bottom. The, uh, those mullions are 10 feet on center. And then in between at the ground floor is a video installation which kind of animates the lower portion of the lobby and then uh, blends with the uh, translucent portion above. Uh, here are a couple of different views, both at nighttime and daytime, of the video installation. So with this art installation, uh, we, we kind of had two uh, uh, objectives. One, we wanted to create the largest uh, public art installation on private property in the city of Chicago. And, and two, we wanted to synthesize the 
you know, this project within a project uh, with the overall building architecture. And the form of the installation is actually 93 independent uh, uh, LED blades that are arranged in kind of a sinusoidal, wavy uh, uh, type uh, arrangement, breaking down that hard horizon line that Jim mentioned between the opaque and the transparent, but really kind of creating a, a sculpture in and of itself. Uh, we then hired, um, on the recommendation of the Art Institute and the School of the Arts, Art Institute, uh, a full-time curator uh, that is employed directly by our firm who spends all of her time uh, basically sourcing uh, unique digital art content for this wall. Probably the most exciting thing about that process is that it's created relationships and engagements with basically every major cultural institution in the city of Chicago. Uh, you know, we, right now we've got a library of upwards of 250 pieces of unique content that are exhibited on a rotating basis uh, with emerging and then blue chip artists. Uh, so it, it's you know tremendously exciting and creates a sense of dynamism, activity, and energy within a lobby space of an office building that you know, without that type of activity might be a little uh, stoic. Uh, we wanted to really, again, create an engagement. Uh, we also opened this, this installation up for public viewing hours outside of business hours of the building. Uh, and, you know, people from the neighborhood are continuously coming through, uh, are able to, you know, sit in the Starbucks adjacent to the lobby uh, and, and interact with, uh, you know, this art installation that we're very proud of. Um, you know, I, I think at the, the outset I mentioned um, uh, the, the design of the building integrating with kind of all of the functional components that we would demand uh, from a development standpoint. And I, I think, you know, the impact of the public realm, from our perspective, the, the, the park space, um, which is over 75% of the site, and then this, this uh, art installation, you know, are kind of the two grand gestures. Because it was basically uh, uh, industrial space before we uh, developed the building, the site generates up, upwards of 15 million of new property taxes to the city of Chicago. Uh, again, there's a TOD emphasis in the design. There's uh, 72 striped parking stalls uh, as part of the development for a 1.2 million square foot office building. So uh, really a minimal amount of parking for this market. Uh, sustainably designed to lead gold. As we all know, it gets harder and harder and harder to hit the same benchmarks. Um, and we were adamant that this, that this building would meet uh, minimum of lead gold when we got started. Um, again, it, it, by capping the tracks and rerouting the exhaust, we've eliminated the train exhaust and noise from the immediate neighbors, uh, the residential building. Um, we're exceptionally proud that 150 North Riverside is, was selected as the global headquarters for three of Chicago's uh, best known uh, born and bred uh, corporations. Uh, the Hyatt Corporations, Global Headquarters, William Blair and Company, uh, Global Investment Bank, and then Navigant Consulting. Uh, and then, you know, uh, we, we've delivered uh, an exceptional amount of uh, food and beverage amenities, uh, both for office tenants and the, the general public alike, again, flanking this, this outdoor open space. So again, on behalf of the development team, I'd like to congratulate the other nominees, uh, thank the, the Council on Tall Buildings and Urban Habitats for, for graciously nominating us for, for this award, um, and say thank you to everybody for uh, uh, listening to our presentation. Thank you very much.